now now i would like to invite dr parjeet kaur from medanta um, she is going to talk about glp1 and incretin therapies mechanisms and new directions uh, very good afternoon to all and uh, i thank dr anupam dr ashok and the entire organizing team for inviting me once again uh well i don't think this matches with the theme the affordable the accessible it definitely accessible but not affordable but i feel glp1 analogs in the management of type 2 diabetes are the real game changers because these are the only molecules which address majority of the pathophysiological defects of diabetes and lots of research is being going on in this field and lots of molecules are being developed newer glp1 analogs the Uh, co-agonist, dual triple co-agonist, and also non-peptide GLP-1 receptor agonist. So, through my talk, I would just want to highlight the importance of these molecules and also discuss in brief the mechanisms of actions of GLP-1 molecules. So, the agenda will be just briefly about the growing challenge we all know: the metabolic defects and the role of incretin therapy, the mechanism of action, the available GLP-1 agonists, the cardioprotective and the cardiorenal. effects the role in the management and the newer directions this i think we all know <laughs> epidemic diabetes epidemic going on in india the cases are rising and currently we have around 77 million people with diabetes in india more than that another important thing to notice here is that more than 50 per 7 percent of these people are undiagnosed that's very much alarming and people are dying from diabetes related causes definitely there is need for i think uh, no doubt the prevention is the first part but also in the treatment we need a molecule which can address the pathophysiological defects so 77 million with diabetes but 77% of these people have poor glycemic control and the mean hba1c in india uh, indian population with type 2 diabetes is 8.6% so let's talk about this incretin concept it developed in 1906 um, and, and it was uh, Uh, described by benjamin moore where he wrote that there is a intestine there's an internal secretion of the pancreas might be stimulated and initiated by a substance of the nature of a hormone or a secretin yielded by the duodenal mucous membrane so there they found that the duodenal mucous membrane extract was releasing the uh, pancreatic secretions hence the name was coined here the intestinal secretion of insulin the incretin later on in 1960s it was found that the incretin effect is diminished in people with type 2 diabetes what you can see here in the left side is the normal incretin effect so what we mean by incretin effect is when the oral glucose load is given which is in green there is much more release of insulin as compared to the here in the down line which is the iv glucose infusion which means the oral glucose is stimulating much more insulin and this this gap which we see is the incretin effect and what was seen in type 2 diabetes patient is that this effect is there but is much more diminished as compared to the normal people and later on when the glp1 analogs the sequence was found out it was found that if you give this glp1 as iv infusion and you compared it with the placebo infusion and what was found that was a drop in the glucose levels as compared to the saline there was a rise in the c peptide level when this iv glp1 given but what's interesting to note here as the glucose levels are dropping here even the c peptide are also dropping here which means that the action of glp1 is completely glucose dependent similarly if you see the glucagon here the suppression of glucagon is happening as the uh, this glp1 infusion is uh, being given but as the glucose levels are dropping glucagon is rising again so this glucose dependent mechanism of glp1 helps that this molecule does not cause hypoglycemia if the patient is eating then only this molecule is going to act and have its effect so the role of incretin later on was described beautifully that it acts on the various levels so once it once the meal is being taken it's being released from the gut and first action is then and there only reduces the gut motility it is inactivated very quickly by an enzyme called dpp4 and therefore the dpp4 inhibitors were developed the main action is the central uh, cns uh, dependent mechanism where it where it reduces appetite and increases the satiety at the level of pancreas both glp1 and gip they increases the glucose dependent insulin release query beta cell regeneration 
whereas only GLP-1 is the one which also uh, reduces the glucagon release when the meal is ingested. Subsequently, by the indirect action, it also improves the glucose intake by the muscles and it reduces the liver glucose production. So if you look at this figure, we all know that to address this complexity, we all know that octet of pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes, we need to consider ther targeting therapies to complement these pathophysiological defects. So if you look at metformin here, it's mainly acting on the liver. Insulin is acting on the liver muscle and the fatty tissues. SGLT2 only at the kidney, sulfonylureas mainly at the pancreatic level, DPP4 inhibitors, alpha, beta cells in the liver. But if you look closely at the GLP-1 RAs, it's, majority, it's covering majority of the pathophysiological defects of the type 2 diabetes, mainly it is covering the muscles, liver, pancreas, brain, intestine, except for the kidney and fat, which it doesn't have any direct action. Majority of the defects are being covered and rectified by this GLP-1 molecule. Going bit and little bit detail about the molecular mechanisms here, so mainly it acts on the three areas. Main action is on the CNS, but the receptors are there on the CNS in the hypothalamus arcuate nucleus. Receptors are also there in the brainstem area. The receptor are there in the gut uh, endothelial in the capillary cells. They are also present in the uh, portal venous system. Mainly by the uh, acting on the arcuate nucleus, it acts on the POMC centers where it reduces the hunger, energy intake and food cravings by acting on the NPY. So basically once this POMC gets activated, NPY gets inhibited, thereby it increases the satiety. This is one of the direct mechanisms, where it indirectly by stimulating the afferent parasympathetic branches, vagus nerves, both in the intestine as well in the portal areas, it stimulates certain brainstem areas, uh, NTS and the para, uh, parabasal A nucleus, where again here by indirectly acting upon through the vagus nerve, it again affects the gut motility and uh, increases the satiety and reduces the appetite. Very interesting to know that not only the GLP-1 RS reduces the food intake, which is the main mechanism of the weight loss, it also somehow changes the food preference. What has been seen is with the semaglutide that the, there's a reduction in the intake of chocolate bars or high calorie dense food when these GLP molecules are given. So which means that uh, GLP-1 RAs actually may promote a healthier food choices. As is in terms of energy expenditure, it has been seen that mostly the energy expenditure, the, the weight kind of tried to resets, but it has been seen that this kind of uh, weight loss induced by semaglutide only transiently suppresses its energy expenditure, it does come back. So in fact, this has been shown in other studies that GLP-1 molecules also suppresses the alcohol craving. So this is very, very important to note that these molecules are kind of suppressing the high carbs intake and the other uh, in, in food intake, which, is, which are detrimental to the development of the type 2 diabetes. They do, do have antithesclerotic benefits and where they are mainly acting upon the endothelial cells, the smooth muscle cells, and the macrophage foam cells. These, these are the cells which are having these GLP-1 receptors acting upon these areas, mainly through various mechanisms. It is kind of suppressing the inflammation, and hence these molecules do have anti-atherosclerotic benefits as well. Just briefly about the evolution, as I talked, 1906 was the one where we discovered that duodenal extracts are stimulating the pancreatic secretion. 1960s, the incretin effect was described. In 1983, the GLP-1 encoding sequence was uh, first found out. And later on, it was shown that it triggers insulin release in vitro. Exendin for the first one to discover in 1994. This was found in the saliva of uh, Gila monster. Uh, uh, where it was found and then subsequently uh, GLP-1 receptor was cloned. First injectable GLP-1 RA licensed was in 2005 and in 2006 we had first DPP-4 inhibitor. Subsequently we had many advancements, many developments and uh, 2014 we had first GLP-1 RA licensed for obesity even in people without diabetes and now 2019 we got first oral peptide and pill which is oral GLP-1 receptor agonist, oral semaglutide for treatment of type 2 diabetes. So these are the currently available when we broadly classified exentin 4 analogs in which we have lexicenatide, exenatide short acting given twice daily or exenatide long acting given weekly and then we have human GLP-1 analogs 
where we have liraglutide, dulaglutide, and semaglutide, both in injectable and the oral form. Briefly about their pharmacokinetics, not going much into the detail, but what you can see, the upper one, these are the shorter actings, hence can, should be given either twice daily in, by, for exenatide, once daily for lexisenatide, rilagrutide, and the lower ones are the longer acting, which can be given once weekly, but semaglutide oral, although has half-life of one week, but has to be given once daily because the bioavailability is very less, it's just 20%. So to compensate for that, we need to give this pill on a daily basis. Briefly about their efficacy, we all know about these trials. So these molecules have been studied head-to-head -head with other oral anti-diabetic agents or other anti-diabetic agents, I would say. And all the trials, including the uh, lead trials, duration, award, uh, sustained with semaglutide or pioneered with oral semaglutide have shown that these molecules are efficacious. In fact, they significantly reduce the HP1C, uh, much more significantly reduce HP1C as compared to the other anti-diabetic agents. As far as the changes in the body weight, because this is one property of this molecule, which is something we are, we want, we, that's why we want to use this because it causes uh, a very good weight loss. And uh, it has been shown that weight loss is there across, across all the trials with majority of the GLP-1, but the highest weight loss, if you see, has been with the use of semaglutide here in the green, uh, the injectable semaglutide, which is much, much more than the other uh, um, uh, GLP-1 analogs, including liraglutide, diloglutide. And here also the research has been done that why is that one GLP is causing more weight loss, other GLP is not. And this is again dependent upon the uh, receptors present and the where exactly are the receptors in the CNS. So semaglutide receptors have been shown that they are acting on the much widespread GLP-1 receptors as compared to the liraglutide and dulaglutide. We have very good data on their CV outcome uh, trials. The, and this meta-analysis clearly shows that they reduce the risk of MACE. Uh, overall, uh, all the GLP-1 have shown the, to have a favorable effect. Uh, and at the end, we get a favorable effect with GLP-1 usage. And hence, the FDA has approved these GLP-1 for the cardiovascular disease indications, including liraglutide, semaglutide, and tulaglutide, that these drugs should be used if the patient has established cardiovascular disease. In terms of kidney outcomes, again, these molecules have shown that they uh, reduce the progression towards microalbuminuria. Here, clearly, very favorable effect and the worsening of kidney function is also reduced by these molecules. As far as the safety is concerned, uh, no hypoglycemia, as I just discussed the mechanism of action. Two concerns are always there, pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer. But then again, the, most of the studies have not shown any significant effect by these molecules, and there was no significant difference between the placebo or this molecule in terms of pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer. So the role in type 2 diabetes clearly in ADA, ADA in 2020 established that if the person has uh, established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, then one must use GLP-1 RA with the proven CVD benefit or SGLT2 inhibitors. If there is a kidney disease or a heart failure, SGLT2 are preferable, but if they're not tolerated, then again, GLP-1 RA should be used. Even if there is no indication for ASCVD or CKD, these molecules are important if there is compelling need to minimize hypoglycemia or compelling need to minimize weight gain or promote weight loss. And in fact, the guidelines also say, and that's what we also do, that before considering insulin therapy, these molecules must be considered because they do address many pathophysiological defects of type 2 diabetes. Hence, we should be focusing more on the upstream approach that it should be a weight-centering weight approach, upstream intervention, rather than later on acting and controlling mainly the glucose, which is the glucocentric approach. So in nutshell, GLP-1 RAs, they have many benefits in terms of high efficacy, cardioprotective, renal benefits, low hypoglycemia, weight loss is a major advantage with this molecule. Minimal or no titration is required when we compare it with insulin. Oral semaglutide now is a very good option when the patients were afraid of taking injections, not just their limitation, of course, they have GI side effects. And, but these mostly GI side effects, they go away when we step up the dose very gradually, these side effects go away over a four to six period, weeks period. 
most are injectable, but now we have oral drug also available. There is a FDA black box warning that there is a risk of thyroid C cell tumors. Therefore, a history of medullary thyroid carcinoma must be taken in the family if any patient you are try trying to start the molecule. And the last slide is on the new directions. As I told, a lot of research being going on. So we have combination of molecules being developed. The dual agonists in the form of GLP-1 glucagon. GLP-1 and GIP terzepatide in the name of Manjaro is already FD approved for type 2 diabetes. Recently we have seen the fake, we have seen the study on the obesity as well recently is going and I'm sure it's going to be approved for obesity soon. We have triple agonist GLP-1, GIP and glucagon in the form of retrotide. Again, last month only NEGM study shows that it causes substantial weight loss up to 25 percent in patients with type 2 diabetes. So I think this key messages I've already covered up in GLP-1 benefits and uh, uh, limitations, but I'm sure it is not affordable. But I think when we always talk to the patient, we talk about the future cost uh, of not diabetes not being controlled, the cost of the cardiovascular diseases being managed, hospitalization. In that way, I feel these are very superior molecules and wonderful molecules and exciting areas of research in future. Thank you very much. Any, any questions? I think if there are no questions, uh, we can conclude the session. Thank you. Thank you. GLP-1 analogs and their advantages. They are the drugs of the future. Probably all of us will be using them yes. in the next few years. Hopefully we develop our own molecule in India and make it affordable. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bajji.